Hello everyone, welcome to the channel Amazing Civil Engineering Studies. Hello friends in this video we will study about Plastering and Pointing Definition, Different Plastering Ratios, Defects in Plastering, Type of Plaster, Types of Pointing, Methods of Pointing Plastering What is plaster? Plastering is the process of covering uneven surfaces and rough walls in the construction of houses and other structures with a plastic material known as plaster, which is a mixture of cement or lime concrete and sand along with the required quantity of water. Plastering is used to protect the exposed surface of masonry. Cement, sand, and lime are used in plastering. Plastering is the way smooth walls were constructed in order to cover a rough textured substrate wall. Historically it was made by slaking lime in water and adding sand, gypsum, and fibers, usually horse or some other animal hair. Plastering the process of applying thin cover of cement mortar over the exposed surface in order to safeguard against penetration of rain water and other atmospheric agencies. It improves the appearance of the structure and gives decorative effect to the interiors. For good plaster, it is essential that the plaster should have proper bond with the surface of masonry to be plastered. Why is plastering done? To prevent water ingress into brickwork blockwork, since both bricks and blocks absorb water from outside. This is the reason why most stone works are left unplastered. In case of walls to make up the issues in underlying brickwork blockwork like plumb outs, diagonal outs, etc. In case of ceilings to make up the undulations caused while casting concrete. Same applies to plastering over RCC walls also. To prepare a proper base for further painting works, Putty application, paint application, wallpaper application, etc. Thus, whenever you happen to see a building plastered from inside and left bare outside advice to do the external plastering soon. Preparation of surface for plastering. For this the surface should be prepared by adopting following steps. All the projections extending more than 13 mm from the general face of the masonry should be knocked off. All the joints in the masonry should be raked for a depth of about 20 mm for good bonding between the cement mortar and masonry. Oily, greasy, and any efflorescence spots should be removed by brushing or scrapping. On old surfaces, the surface should be made rough before applying the plaster. Before applying plaster over the surface, it should be thoroughly washed by water to remove any loose material and keep it wet. Water to be used for plaster work should be potable and free from soluble salts. Uniform thickness of plaster should be maintained to avoid irregular finish. Usually on ceiling 12 mm thick and on walls 15 mm thick plaster should be done. The proportion for plaster on ceiling should be richer than 1 colon 3 and for walls it should be richer than 1 colon 6. The plaster should be cured by sprinkling water at least thrice a day for minimum 7 days. 
Different plastering ratios of cement mortar used. Mix ratio of mortar. General usage recommended. 1 colon 3. As it's a rich mortar mix, and it is used where external walls are prone to severe climatic conditions. It is also used for repair works. 1 colon 4. Used for ceiling and external walls. 1 colon 5. Brickwork mortar and for internal plaster. 1 colon 6. For internal plaster, fine sand is available. Quantities of cement, sand, and water in various plaster mix ratio. Area plaster thickness. Mix ratio of mortar. Cement. Sand. Water 10 sqm. 12 millimeters. 1 colon 3. 49.37 kilograms 3.77 cubic feet 44 lit 10 sqm 12 millimeters 1 colon 4 39.29 kilograms 3.99 cubic feet 44 lit 10 sqm 12 millimeters 1 colon 5 32.54 kilograms 4.14 cubic feet 44 lit 10 sqm 12 millimeters 1 colon 6 27.8 kilograms 4.24 cubic feet 44 lit requirements of good plaster it should adhere to this background and should remain adhered to during all climatic changes it should be cheap and economical it should be hard and durable. It should be possible to apply it during all weather conditions. It should effectively check the penetration or entry of moisture from the surfaces. It should possess good workability. Type of plaster Gypsum plaster Lime plaster, cement plaster, clay plaster, heat resistant plaster, waterproof plaster, gypsum plaster. This is widely used plaster materials that can be mined naturally or produced as a byproduct. Therefore, important gypsum plaster that's employed as undercoat finish coat and replaced cement broadly and lime. Moreover, small expansion of gypsum is considered significant property that prevent cracks and shrinkages. There are various types of gypsum plaster that are produced by heating gypsum to a specific degree, for example, anhydrous gypsum manufactured by heating gypsum up to 170 degrees centigrade, hemihydrates gypsum produced by heating gypsum more than 170 degrees centigrade. Furthermore, depending on applications for ceilings or walls, gypsum plasters could be categorized like casting, undercoat, finish, one coat, and machine applied plaster. 
Lime plaster. This brings us to lime plaster, which, as stated earlier, is made up of sand, lime, and water. The lime in question is generally non hydraulic lime, which, of course, can also be called lime putty. Incredibly, the use of lime plaster dates back as far as 7200 BC, where statues sculpted in lime plaster were found buried in a pit in the archaeological site of a gazal in modern-day Jordan. This is the perfect example of just how durable lime plaster is as a building material. Often products may be used as both a lime plaster and a lime render since the lime putty utilized is durable enough to withstand the weather conditions encountered in external use. This is just one of many benefits of using lime plaster or lime render. Though this on climate and geographical location. For any help choosing the right lime plaster, please do get in touch. Clay plaster Clay plaster is considered to be a more sustainable alternative to modern plasters, using a lower embodied energy than gypsum, lime, or cement-based plasters. It's available with fiber additives to increase its strength and in a range of natural colors. It is breathable and doesn't need to be painted. Heat-resistant plaster Heat-resistant plaster is a building material used for coating walls and chimney breasts and also for use as a fire barrier in ceilings. Its purpose is to replace conventional gypsum plasters in cases where the temperature may get too high for gypsum plaster to stay on the ceiling or wall. Waterproof plaster Waterproof plaster is needed for the protection of the masonry wall from the ingress of moisture and thus eliminating or reducing dampness of the wall. The plaster is made from sand and cement mix 1, 2. Pulverized alum is added at the rate of 12 kg per cubic meter of sand. Soft soap in the rate of 75 gms per liter is added from the water for mixing. Alum and soap react chemically and seal the pores from the plaster. Cement plaster Cement plaster is a mixture of suitable plaster, sand, Portland cement, and water which is normally applied to masonry interiors and exteriors to achieve a smooth surface. Interior surfaces sometimes receive a final layer of gypsum plaster. Walls constructed with stock bricks are normally plastered while face brick walls are not plastered. Various cement-based plasters are also used as proprietary spray fireproofing products. These usually use vermiculite as lightweight aggregate. Heavy versions of such plasters are also in use for exterior fireproofing, to protect LPG vessels, pipe bridges, and vessel skirts. The advantages of cement plaster noted at that time were its strength, hardness, quick setting time and durability. Work Procedure of Plastering on Masonry Surfaces Standard Specifications Used for the Plastering Work there are Indian standards which need to be followed during plastering work. Indian Standard, Biscodes IS 383 Specification for Coarse and Fine Aggregates for Natural Sources for Concrete 
IS 1542 Specifications for Sand for Plaster IS 2645 Specifications for Integral Cement Waterproofing Compound IS 8112 Specification for 43 Grade OPC IS 269 Specification for 33 Grade OPC IS 1489 Specification for Portland Pozzolana Cement For preparing the plaster work first arrange the tools required for plaster. Trowel A trowel is an important plastering tool that allows you to smooth the plaster after applying it to the wall. Hawk A hawk is used by the professionals to carry the plaster with them as they move down the wall. Mud pen A mud pen can be used instead of a hawk for the less experienced plasterer. Sponge slash sandpaper to clean the wall for plastering. Jointing knife A utility knife or scissors will help cut plaster tape to size. The utility knife is employed to square out the edge of the hole to be plastered over if repairing damaged walls. Step ladder to reach the height. Bucket for water. Procedure of plastering work Preparation of surface for plastering Keep all the mortar joints of wall rough, so as to give a good bonding to hold plaster. Roughen the entire wall to be plastered. Clean all the joints and surfaces of the wall with a wire brush. There should be no oil or grease etc. left on wall surface. If there exist any cavities or holes on the surface, then fill it in advance with appropriate material. If the surface is smooth or the wall to be plastered is old one, then rake out the mortar joint to a depth of at least 12 mm to give a better bonding to the plaster. Wash the mortar joints and entire wall to be plastered, and keep it wet for at least 6 hours before applying cement plaster. If the projection on the wall surface is more than 12 mm, then knock it off, so as to obtain a form surface of wall. This will reduce the consumption of plaster. Groundwork for plaster in order to get uniform thickness of plastering throughout the wall surface, first fix dots on the wall. A dot means patch of plaster of size 15 mm asterisk 15 mm and having thickness of about 10 mm. Dots are fixed on the wall first horizontally and then vertically at a distance of about 2 meters covering the entire wall surface. Check the verticality of dots, one over the other, by means of plumb bob. After fixing dots, the vertical strips of plaster, known as screeds, are formed in between the dots. These screeds serve as the gauges for maintaining even thickness of plastering being applied. Applying under coat or base coat. In case of brick masonry the thickness of first coat plaster is in general 12 mm and in case of concrete masonry this thickness varies from 9 to 15 mm. The ratio of cement and sand for first coat plaster varies from 1 colon 3 to 1 colon 6. Apply the first coat of plaster between the spaces formed by the screeds on the wall surface.
This is done by means of trowel. Level the surface by means of flat wooden floats and wooden straight edges. After leveling, left the first coat to set but not to dry and then roughen it with a scratching tool to form a key to the second coat of plaster. Applying finishing coat The thickness of second coat or finishing coat may vary between 2 to 3 millimeters. The ratio of cement and sand for second coat plaster varies from 1 colon 4 to 1 colon 6. Before applying the second coat, damp the first coat evenly. Apply the finishing coat with wooden floats to a true even surface and using a steel trowel, give it a finishing touch. As far as possible, the finishing coat should be applied starting from top towards bottom and completed in one operation to eliminate joining marks. Curing of plastering works After completion of the plastering work, it is kept wet by sprinkling water for at least 7 days in order to develop strength and hardness. Use of gunny bags or other materials is used to keep the plastering works wet in external works. Improper curing may lead to cracks formation or efflorescence in plaster work. Summary Process of plastering work After preparing surface Prepare the mortar mix. Then put dots on the wall to make sure even layering of plasters on the wall. These dots are patch of plasters. This is patches are putted to do the even layering of plaster. Then put the first layer of plaster coat on wall and then second layer. Then level the surface by flat wooden edges. The leave it for settle down after that do the curing process. Points to remember. Remove loose mortar from joints and moisten the surface before plastering. And remove loose mortar from joints and moisten the surface before plastering. Use a 1 colon 4 ratio mortar of cement and fine sand. For coarse sand, the ratio can be changed to 1 colon 4 mix is preferred for best results. Ensure that the entire mix for the day is not prepared at one go. It is advisable to use the prepared mix within one hour. However, you can prepare and keep the dry mix ready. Ensure that the dry mix is uniform in color before adding water. Use chicken wire mesh while plastering joints between concrete work and brick work. Use a wooden float for finishing rather than steel float. Cleaning of doors or frame and floor area is necessary at the completion of work. Curing should be started as soon as the plaster has hardened sufficiently and must be cured for at least 7 days. Curing shall commence, 24 hours after the plaster is laid. Ensure continuous curing for 10 to 14 days. Types of plaster finishes used in building construction are Different types of plaster finishes with different appearances are available as follows. Smooth cast finish Rough cast finish Sand faced finish Pebble dash finish Scrap finish
Depiter finish. Textured finish. Smooth cast plaster finish. To obtain smooth cast finish, mortar used should be in the ratio 1, 3 cement, sand. Fine sand should be taken to prepare the mortar. For spreading the mortar, skimming float or wood float is best suitable tool. Hence, smooth and leveled surface is obtained finally. Rough cast plaster finish. Rough cast finish is also called as spatter dash finish. Mortar used to get rough cast finish consist coarse aggregate along with cement and sand. Their ratio is about 1, 1 1.5, 3. The size of coarse aggregate used is 3 mm to 12 mm. Large quantity of mortar is taken by trowel and it is dashed into the surface and leveled using wooden float. Usually this type of plaster finish is preferred for external renderings. Sand-faced plaster finish To get sand-faced finish two coats of plastering is required. For first coat, 12 mm thick layer of cement sand mortar in 1, 4 ratio is preferred. The first coat should be provided in zigzag lines. And then it is allowed for curing for 7 days. After that 8 mm thick layer of second coat with cement and sand in 1 colon 1 ratio is applied. Level the surface using sponge. Finally take some sand and screened it to obtain uniform grain size. The screened sand is applied on the second coat using skimming float or wooden float. Finally, sand faced finish with uniform grain size of sand is obtained. Pebble dash plaster finish. Pebble dash finish requires mortar layer of 12 mm thickness with cement and sand in the ratio of 1, 3. After plastering pebbles of size 10 mm to 20 mm are dashed onto the plastered surface. Then press them into the plastered surface using wooden float slowly. After hardening they provide aesthetic appearance to the structure. Scrapped plaster finish To obtain scrapped finish, apply final coat of 6 to 12 mm thickness and allow it to dry. After some time using steel blade or plate scrap the plastered layer up to 3 mm depth. Scrap finish is less liable to cracks. Depiter plaster finish. This is also similar to pebble dash finish. But in this case pieces of gravel or flints are used in place of pebbles. Textured plaster finish Textured finish is obtained from the stucco plastering in which different textures or shapes are made on the final coat using suitable tools. External rendering of buildings Generally, external face of buildings constructed from concrete or clay blocks are not assumed to be pleasing aesthetically and do not provide attractive appearances that is why the external faces are changed and rendered by two or three coats of lime or cement mixed with natural aggregate and finished textured or smooth moreover Rendering improves and increases wall resistant to penetration of rainfall. Furthermore, external rendering is based on strong bond to the background, utilized mixtures, and surface finish. Defects observed in plastering. 
Different types of defects occur in plastering work such as blistering, cracks, efflorescence, flaking. Peeling, popping, softness and uneven surfaces. These defects in plastering need to be repaired as soon as they are observed. Types of defects in plastering. Blistering of plastered surface. Cracks in plastering. Efflorescence on plastered surface. Flaking. Peeling. Popping. Uneven plaster surface. Softness of the plaster. Rust stains on plastered surface. Blistering of plastered surface. Blistering of the plastered surface occurs when small patches swell out beyond the plane of the plastered surface. Blistering is seen in case of plastered surface inside the building. Cracks in plastering. Cracks are formed on the plastered surface. These cracks can be hairline cracks which are difficult to notice, or it can be wider cracks which are easily seen. The development of fine cracks is known as crazing. Cracks on a plastered surface can be due to thermal movements, discontinuity of surface, structural defects in the building, faulty workmanship, excessive shrinkage etc. Efflorescence on plastered surface Efflorescence is formed on plasters when soluble salts are present in plaster making materials as well as building materials such as bricks, sand, cement etc. Even water used in the construction work may contain soluble salts. When a newly constructed wall dries out, the soluble salts are brought to the surface and they appear in the form of a whitish crystalline substance. Such a growth is referred to as efflorescence and it seriously affects the adhesion of paint with the wall surface. Efflorescence gives a very bad appearance and can be removed to some extent by dry bushing and washing the surface repeatedly. Flaking The formation of a very small loose mass on the plastered surface is known as flaking and it is mainly due to bond failure between successive coats of plaster. Peeling the plaster from some portion of the surface comes off and a patch is formed. Such formation is termed as peeling and it is mainly due to bond failure between successive coats of plaster. Rust stains on plastered surface Rust stains are sometimes seen on the plastered surface especially when plaster is applied on metal lath. Popping Sometimes the plaster mix contains particles which expand on being set. A conical hole in plastered surface is formed in front of the particle. This conical hole is called as blow or pop. Uneven plaster surface Uneven surface defect becomes prominent only due to poor workmanship of the plastering work. Softness of the plaster The excessive dampness at certain points on the plastered surface makes that portion soft. The main reasons for such softness are undue thinness of the finishing coats, presence of deliquescent salts, excessive suction of the undercoats etc. How to repair plaster walls Repairing of plaster walls procedures involved in repair of plaster are 
Identify plaster wall problem. The type of damage shall be specified prior to the commence of repairing operation. In this manner, the most suitable technique and equipment can be employed to repair the damage and best outcome could be achieved. Table provide types of plaster wall problems and their causes, common types of plaster wall problem. Cause of the plaster wall problem. Cracks. Hairline cracks due to moisture evaporation, delaminating crack because plaster pulling away from the lath behind it, and settlement cracks because of building settlement. Damage Activity inside the home like a collision due to moving a piece of furniture blistering. Improper slaking of lime particles in the plaster flaking. Poor bond. Fig.1 to Fig.3 shows number of plaster wall problems that need to be repaired. Setting up scaffolding. Scaffolding is required for the proper execution of the repair work should be erected. Ladder can also be used in case of scaffolding if the work can be done safely. Protective measure doors, windows, floors, articles of furniture etc. and such other parts of the building should be protected from being splashed by mortar. Cutting of old plaster The mortar of the patch, where the existing plaster has cracked, crumbled, or sounds hollow when gently tapped on the surface, is first removed. The patch is be cut out to a square or rectangular shape at position where repairing is needed. The edges of cut plaster is made undercut to provide a neat joint. Preparation of surface The masonry joints which become exposed after removal of old plaster is raked out to a minimum depth of 10 mm in the case of brick work and 20 mm in the case of stone work. The raking is carried out uniformly with a raking tool, and loose mortar is dusted off. The surface is then thoroughly washed with water, and kept wet till plastering is commenced. In case of concrete surfaces, the old plaster is thoroughly scrubbed with wire brushes after the plaster had been cut out, and pock marked the surface is roughened by wire brushing, and all the resulting dust and loose particles cleaned off. The surface is washed and cleaned and kept wet till plastering is commenced. Application of plaster mortar of specific mix such as 1,4 or 1,6 with the good quality plaster sand is used. After the plaster has been applied to the surface, finishing of plaster is done to match with the old surrounding plaster. Curing of plaster Curing of plaster is necessary to prevent cracking. It should be done for at least three days at regular interval. Finishing of plaster After the plaster is thoroughly cured and dried the surface is then painted with the color of the surrounding area. Advantages and Disadvantages of Plaster Advantages of plaster It expands very slightly on setting. It is not likely to cause cracking of surfaces. It forms a thick surface to resist normal knocks after drying. It is easy to spread and level. It mixes up easily with water. It has no appreciable chemical action on paint and does not cause alkali attack.
Tiles and blocks of plaster of Paris have the specific advantage of lightness and high re-resistance. Plaster of Paris gives adcorative interior finish. Disadvantages of plaster Gypsum plaster is not suitable for exterior finish as it cannot be used in damp finish. Element cannot be mixed with plaster of Paris. It is more expensive than cement or cement lime plaster. It cannot be used in moist situations. The labor cost for applying plaster of Paris is high. Pointing What is pointing work in civil engineering? Pointing is the process of placing of mortar usually cement or lime mortar in the ratio of 1 colon 1 or 1 colon 2 in cement scenario and 1 colon 2 in lime mortar and usually adopted where the exterior joints of the bricks or stones are not to be covered by plaster. Mostly employed for aesthetical appearance. In brick stone masonry, Joints are weak and most vulnerable where dampness can enter. Implementation of joints to a depth of 10 to 20 mm and filling it with better quality mortar in desired shape is called pointing in civil brick work. What is pointing? Pointing is the term given to the finish that sits between the bricks or stone used to build your home. Depending on the age of the building, the mortar used to deposit the stone or brick will be made of lime or, more recently, cement. Pointing incorrectly causes irreparable damage to older buildings. It is essential to understand what mortar joints really do for the fabric of the home. The function of mortar on the wall is to act as a foundation between stones and varies from fine joints in the stonework to larger joints in rubble masonry walls. The joints are effectively reduced in size by inserting small stones and cut pieces of stone. While acting as a bed, the mortar must also perform other functions. It must prevent water from penetrating through the joints due to its physical presence almost like a masonry sponge but it must allow the wall to breathe and drain, porosity being a key factor when choosing amortar to refer to. It must be flexible to allow movement settlement of the structure due to thermal responses and settlement within the structure. Many former large buildings are not designed with today's modern expansion contraction joints. The strength of the mortar should always be less than that of the surrounding stones and should be considered as a sacrificial element of the wall and seen as a maintenance item that needs to be replaced, possibly every century. The condition of the stone walls cannot be seen in isolation, and replacing any walls will not cure water ingress problems caused by other construction failures, such as gutters, roofs, and lead. They must be in good condition to maintain the useful life of the wall elements. The walls need to breathe, and, if the indicator does not allow it, the wall will quickly deteriorate. Mortar joints are the lungs of a wall, they allow water inside the structure to enter and exit freely. If the water tries to come out through stone or brick, it will slowly disintegrate. Block the mortar joints, and the wall will be destroyed. The mortar must be softer than the material with which the wall is constructed. 
the indication must be subservient to the material with which the wall is constructed and visually assume a Types of pointing Pointing can be carried out in a number of shapes. The choice of a particular type will depend on the nature of masonry and the effect required. Following are the usual types of pointing. Beaded pointing Flush pointing Recessed pointing Rubbed or keyed or grooved pointing. Struck pointing. Tuck pointing. V pointing. Weathered pointing. Beaded pointing. It is formed by steel or ironed with a concave etch. It looks good but will damage easily when compared to other types. This can be described as the reverse of grooved pointing. The appearance of the mortar is in the form of a bead, projecting outwards relative to the rest of the mortar. The initial process, as with the rest of the pointing types, is exactly the same filling and pressing of mortar in the rake joints to finish flush with the walls. The still green mortar is then given a beaded appearance through the center line with the help of a steel rod of suitable cross section. Flush pointing In this type, the mortar is pressed hard on the joint joints and ends flush with the edge of the masonry units. The edges are well trimmed with a spatula and a straight edge. It doesn't look good. However, aiming the flush is more durable because it resists the provision of space for dust, water, etc. For this reason, this method is widely used. This is, by far, the simplest and also the most widely used kind of pointing for buildings. In this kind of pointing, the richer mortar mix is filled in the rake joints of the masonry, and is given a very smooth appearance by finishing it off flush with the walls. Trimming and neatness of the edges can be ensured by using a pointing trowel. Recessed point In this case, the mortar is pressing 5 mm or more at the edges. During the placement of the mortar, the face of the sharpener is held vertically, using a switchable tool. This guy looks really good. Grooved pointing or keyed pointing The initial steps of this kind of pointing work are the same as that of flush pointing. The mortar mix is pressed against the rake joints and is finished flush with the walls. After this, a small groove is made in this mortar while it is still green, with the help of a small steel rod, of about 6 mm in diameter. This groove is made along the center line of the joints. The same treatment goes for vertical joints. Struck pointing This can be termed as a kind of sloped pointing. The mortar mix which is applied and pressed into the rake joints is, while still green, neatly pressed back by a few millimeters, say 3 to 5. This gives the top part of the pointing a sloped finish, and adds an overall texture as well as pattern to the building facade. Pointing is an excellent means to lend a perfect finish to exposed masonry, which is a quickly growing trend today. Several famous architects are reverting to the exposed masonry techniques to spruce up exteriors and interiors alike. Homes are not far behind in this matter.
Industrial style interior design often employs exposed bricks for interior walls. Pointing, hence, can be a really interesting visual and tangible alternative for such walls. Tuck pointing in this case, the mortar is pressed first at the anchor joint and finished with the face. While the pressed mortar is green, the channel or narrow channel is cut in the center of the channel, which is 5 mm wide and 3 mm deep. This groove is then filled with white cement mass, projected beyond the face of the joint by 3 mm. If the projection is made in the mortar, it is called a pointing bastard or half a bend point. This type of pointing is also quite common for exposed brick structures. The procedure is very simple. First, mortar is applied and pressed in the rake joints of the masonry. Then it is finished flush with the wall. While the mortar is still green the top and bottom parts of the mortar are scooped out in parallel sections, thus leaving you with erased band that is uniform all throughout. Though it involves a little more detailed work than other kinds of pointing, tucked pointing gives a brilliant finish and appearance to exposed masonry construction. V pointing this is formed by forming a V groove in the leveled finishing face. Weathered pointing this is done by making a V-shaped projection. Mortar for pointing works. 1. 2 lime mortar, 1 fat lime, 2 sand. 1. 3 cement mortar, 1 cement, 3 sand. Surface preparation for aiming. All masonry joints are joined to a depth of 20 mm, while the mortar is still soft. The joints and surfaces are cleaned and then completely wet. Pointing Methods After preparing the surface, as mentioned above, the mortar is carefully placed on the joints using a small spatula. The mortar placed must have the desired shape. Whenever the fresh mortar is placed on the joints, it must be pressed hard to obtain a strong connection with the old internal mortar. Care must be taken when using first class ashlar or masonry. Otherwise, the mortar does not cover the edges of the face. The pointed surface is kept wet for at least a week or plowed after application. Method of Pointing Pointing is carried out in the following steps. The mortar of the masonry joints to be covered by pointing is raked out at least to a depth of 20 mm. The dust from the masonry joints is removed by brushes. The surface is then washed with clean water and it is kept wet for a few hours. The mortar is then carefully placed in desired shape in these prepared joints. The mortar is placed by a small trowel and it is slightly pressed to bring it into close contact with the old interior mortar of the joints. The finished surface is well, watered for a period of at least 3 days, if lime mortar is used and 10 days, if cement mortar is used. Advantages and Disadvantages of Pointing Advantages of Brick Pointing Improves the overall looks of the structure. Reduces the need for other repair or rehabilitation work. Keeps the walls of the structure safe from adverse effects of weather.
improves the structural strength of the building. Brick pointing prevents a reduction in the value of the property. Difference between plastering and pointing. Plastering The term plastering is used to describe the thin mortar covering that is applied on the surface of the wall and ceilings. The plaster removes the unevenness of the surface and sometimes used to develop decorative effects. Pointing The term pointing is used to denote the finishing of mortar joints of either stone or brick masonry. The joints are racked out to a depth of about 20 mm and then, these space are filled up by suitable mortar in the desired shape. Following are the main object of providing pointing. To improve the appearance of the structure as a whole and give a smooth surface. To protect the exposed surface from the effect of atmospheric actions. To rectify the defective workmanship or to conceal interior materials. Difference between plastering and pointing are as follows. S. No. Plastering. Pointing. 1. It covers the whole surface. It covers only joints of bricks. 2. It protects the whole surface from atmospheric effect. It protects the brick mortar used in bonding bricks. 3. Multiple coating may be applied. Apply only a single coat. 4. It provides an even regular and smooth surface. It does not provide an even, smooth and regular surface. 5. It conceals the defective workmanship. It cannot conceal the defective workmanship. 6. It requires a comparatively leaner mix. Require comparatively richer mix. 7. It is costly as mortar required is more. Economical as mortar required is less. S. No. Plastering. Pointing. 8. It is necessary in case of interior quality brick masonry work, to conceal unevenness of surface patches etc. Used where architectural appearance is needed more often in case of stone work. 9. It provides a base or ground surface for decorating by whitewashing etc. It does not provide a base or ground surface for decorating by whitewashing etc. Thank you for watching. For watching. For now. Please subscribe, like, share and do not forget to press bell icon.